there is one phrase that is certain to bring a twinkle to the eye of a Royal Society librarian like Keith Moore here, it is MS-131. Oh yes. Keith, what is in this scrapbook called MS-131? Just about anything you can think of. It's uh, illustrations that weren't placed in a main series of archives. Some of them are very definitely associated with philosophical transactions illustrations. Some are from book illustrations. Some were just presented as, as, as uh, things that were seen at meetings of the Royal Society. And some have no story at all. So it's a, it's a great treasure chest. Come on then. We're very excited about this. Let's open this up. MS-131. Open Sesame. We've got a table of contents at the start, but let's ignore the table of contents because that's just going to ruin the surprise. Here we go. We start with a fish. Yeah. This fish was found oh. following an old raft overgrown with barnacles. Correct, yes. Well, <laughs> this is the kind of random stuff we're going to get here. We have a barnacle chasing fish. Yep. Followed by a doctor fish. And this fish has been drawn on the back of a bunch of calculations. I think what's happened is they've had a spare sheet of paper on the back of the fish and, and they want to do a bit of rapid working out and therefore here's a few quick sums. All right, and on we press. Wow. That's fabulous, isn't it? Look at that's that. That's really good. So that's a chameleon. Mm -hmm. Look at this beautiful gold writing underneath. That's right. Now, the artist of this was a Royal Society secretary called Richard Waller and he is one of the great English natural history artists of the period. Beautiful. Okay, I think I know what's coming here. Keith has a very deep affection for pictures of grass. Grass is very, very beautiful. And these illustrations, again by Richard Waller, are intended to help along a work by John Ray, a very great botanist. These are very exact representations of what the grass looked like. So he had the specimen in front of him. He did one-to-one -one scale drawings, picking out the features that would help you identify the grass. So this is essentially a set of field guides. This grass is too big to go on the sheet of paper, so what he's done is he's cut it, shown you where the cut is and where the other strand is. So this is exact scientific method in showing these plants. I just think they're beautiful. So if you just turn a few pages into the sequence, mm -hmm. you begin to see some familiar English wildflowers. Oh, it's, it's, it's a crime to skip these. <laughs> here we go. Mm, here we go. So these are English dead nettles. He does the red and white varieties here. You can see he doesn't call it dead nettle as I would today. He calls it red archangel. Very nice. Look at that primrose. Fantastic. A pre-Raphaelite artist could have painted that and couldn't have done it any better. It's a nice primrose. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Keith, is this book just full of flowers and grass? Oh, what could be better? <laughs> However, here we go. We're finally finished with the flowers and the grass. And we have another fish. <laughs> Not just any fish, though. This is a fish that I think we may have seen before. This is Captain Halley's fish. These fishes were taken and drawn and given to the Royal Society by Captain Halley. That's Edmund Halley, Mr. Halley's Comet. Yep. November 6, 1700. He was a sea captain. He did three voyages on HMS Paramore, and these are some of the fish he collected on his uh, South Atlantic voyages. There's a little Halley fish collection. There's a third one. I mean, we have this picture of, was that an urn or? I don't know yeah, what that is. It's a flaming urn. And, and if you're a Londoner, you will probably know something like this very well, because on the top of the monument, which is the place in London that commemorates where the Great Fire of London began, and on the top of it, you'll see a flaming urn. Is that, the same? is that the one? Yeah, presumably yes. The fellows were very interested in antiquities. So if they found archeological features and they might be medieval, they might be Roman. This one, as you can see, is a grave from 1622. If they thought it was interesting, they'd record it, send it to the Royal Society. On this next page here, we have a, a wall with a big hole in it. Ah, it's not just any wall. Oh, this is a fantastic wall. This is a uh, drawing by Martin Lister, and it's of York City walls. Okay. So Martin Lister did some very interesting work on determining what was a Roman ruin by measuring the size of the brickwork. Now look at this. This is proper Da Vinci code. This is Keith Warner. Oh, is mm, that? Not sure. It could be runes, maybe. There's certainly some coins here as well. So this is again antiquities. This is history corner in MS 131. Yeah, it's, it's archaeological material that's been found and they're trying to understand who put this in place. 
it looks like a field system here, so you can see the gate in the field. And this is a series of tombs or monuments. Ah. Just pause it right there, Brady, because this is one of the most important drawings in the collection. This is a drawing of the stone circles at Avebury. Now, the great monuments in England are, of course, Stonehenge, which is a stone circle, and we know and love that. Avebury, the stone circles are built within the town of Avebury itself. Early fellows were fascinated by this and John Aubrey, Walter Charlton went and, and, and sketched the stone circles and uh, tried to get King Charles II interested in them. And of course, eventually these things were preserved, but this is the earliest record and therefore a lot of these stones were robbed out afterwards. So this is a key document in the archaeology of that region. Just a single document you can see here. It's really faint. It is, yeah. So you can see the crossroads here. You can see the stones that form the circles of the monument, but also you can see the houses and the church at Avebury. Mm. Fantastically important, this thing. I think we're running out of time at the moment, but we will be back very soon to continue the second half of MS 131. What do you say? Will you join us for that? Watch this space. All right. This two volumes here, about the history of the Royal Society. Here it is, the same book expanded out to eight volumes. And this is because of a process called Grangerization. That's right, yes, named after James Granger. So you take your favorite book and you start producing a larger book through adding illustrations, uh, letters, printed material, anything you can get your hands on that enhances the book experience.